Stanford University. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, Stanford uh, Electrical Engineering Computer Systems Colloquium. Uh, my name is Dennis Allison. and I've been uh, incognito for a, quite a while here. Uh, Andy said I had to uh, give the uh, introductions today, so uh, we'll see what happens. I've been spending much of my time being the organizer in the background rather than uh, being out in the face-to-face uh, -to, -face to, the, to the world. Um, next week's talk. Uh, Bianca Schroeder from uh, the Computer Science Department of the University of Toronto uh, will come and talk about uh, uh, DRAM errors in the wild, a large-scale field study. It's data that came from uh, a, a search engine company just down the road, and uh, uh, they have uh, uh, found, uh, examining existing data, that DRAMs don't behave in the way that uh, most people think they do. And as it, they should be. well, or as they should, certainly that. But it should be it should be very interesting, and uh, it actually has probably major implications in how you want to build machines these days. Um, today's talk is by Susan Weniger. Uh, she is a biologist, and is going to talk about construction of de novo biological process control circuits, parts and engineering principles. This is the application of genetic engineering at some level to making useful things wetware in some sense as opposed to hardware or software uh, but uh, something that uses uh, digital systems principles in uh, biological systems. So you. you're on. Thank That's you. it. Uh, my first introduction to circuits was at the age of 18 studying with a fellow by the name of Otto Schmidt. Schmidt was an unusual character um, but pretty much hardwired me for thinking about the world in engineering terms. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to take you through what the parts are that we use and how basically these parts can be used to construct circuits in the classical sense of what a circuit is. Um, so first, I'm going to give you 15 second DNA. 15-second um, DNA. Uh, we started off with DNA, figured out what it is. Watson and Crick, double helix, doesn't look like that at all. Um, second thing we like to do is do sequence. Um, if you can run a reaction that hits one of the bases at a, uh, approximately one hit uh, per piece, what you can do is run a ladder and you can actually read it. Uh, then people snipped it and cloned it, and then they ran PCR and made copies of it. And then some people came along recently and do both sequencing and PCR at the same time as the enzyme goes along and actually reads it. Um, then we got to siRNA, which is a way of inhibiting the DNA. But nobody's really cracked DNA in the sense of being able to make it work for us and make it do anything we want it to do. And I think the reason is, is that the tools weren't available. And the tools are now available. And what the tools are is something called molecular locks. And what molecular locks are, they're molecular assemblies which bind cooperatively to nucleic acids. And the, print, the, the features of molecular locks make them uniquely suited for exactly this task, building circuits. What is a molecular lock? Well, I'm going to show you a picture of it. This kind of cute, cute diagram of, of what it is. Um, you have sequences, and if you can actually uh, engage more than one sequence at the same time cooperatively, you get great specificity for that sequence. And the biophysical principle is that if you bind something cooperatively with two things, you essentially the n squared minus n, the binding affinity. And that does a really uh, does something really nice for you, which is it allows you to target very, very specific structures in the nucleic acids so that you can actually have a situation where you're building something from a set of parts which are found frequently in the genome, but you're going to target a specific structural phrase. And I'm going to explain exactly how that works. And once you know what all the parts are, then you can start to combine them in circuits. So let's see. Uh, can we go to the next one? Let me do this. Here we go. Um, okay, so cooperative assembly allows you basically to target a specific nucleic acid. And I'll explain why that is. Okay, if you start off with a wild type protein, and let's just imagine that your proteins were binding over a four base pair region. So you have four bases and four bases. You have 256 molecules to recognize your entire genome. You start off with a molecule, it's going to appear everywhere in the genome. 
So how do you make something which recognizes a structural free? Let's just say it binds, your first molecule binds to all, and your second molecule binds to good, and your second, third molecule binds to men. The molecule that binds to all is going to bind everywhere. Okay? But you want this phrase, all good men. How do you build a molecule that binds all good men? The way you do it is, it's counterintuitive. You downshift the binding affinity of each of the units. Now they're each binding to all and good and men, specifically each one, but very, very low level. So they're binding and falling off, and binding and falling off. When they cooperatively bind, the first two that come in and cooperatively bind, you go n squared minus n. Now you're at n cubed minus n squared. All of a sudden you have extreme specificity and affinity, but only for the target sequence. And that's actually uh, something we patented, um, Arthur and I. And we figured that had to be how it worked before people figured out exactly how it worked. And so this is the feature that we use in order to direct a molecular lock specifically to that, that thing. You'll see this later um, when we talk about how to use this in, in circuits. Okay, so is, is there any questions on that principle? Okay. Basically, what you're, you're, you're doing is, then you're also non-interfering with normal cellular trafficking. Because if, you're, if your transcription factors, the thing that controls things in the cells, are running around, and you have a molecule which is binding very tightly everywhere, you're going to interfere with normal trafficking. But if you have a molecule that only binds tightly exactly to the target, then you have target-specific control of whatever it is you're turning on and off. And because it's so specific, you can then start to design circuits which are alongside of circuits which are already in the cell that act either in parallel or in series with those. So this is, but you have to understand that principle before you can go before that. Okay, this shows binding competition in a two-component system, and it's just a little um, swift of that. So you have your binding sites A, they're everywhere, and then you have A, B is what you're going for. So you start off and you find a molecule that binds to A. <laughs> then you downshift the binding affinity of that and you chaperone it so that it has, a it has something which, which effectively creates the cooperativity. On the first pass, this guy, which is binding now less than this guy and, and way less than this guy, is going to hit, but it's going to get knocked off. So inside of the cell or inside of your diagnostic or wherever your system is, this is what your result's going to be. And that feature of molecular locks allows you to have great specificity for your targets. Once you can identify your target, you can control it, and you can build circuits that control it. Can we interrupt you briefly? Sure. Can I swap mics with you? Uh, oh, no. here's the problem. Oh, that's, that's, the that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do with it? Just put it on. <laughs> <laughs> it turns Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> um, go yeah. ahead, and you can hook this um, to... I can just hold it. Okay, you could hold it, and then just have to make sure that this is hanging out. And where do you want and that? If you could cook this up by your collar. Okay, I'll be here. Yes, that could be perfect. Oops, which, okay, which way is it? We thought the mic was working too. Okay, sorry about that. Is that good? Perfect. Can you hear me? Thank you. Do, will, you will you know? Just wave, bang. Just, just go thumbs down if it's not good. Okay, yeah, all right, good. Down. Sorry about that, guys. Um, it's good. Thank can you. you. Can you go back one slide, please? Sure, sure. Oops. Uh-oh. Here we go. Um, I, I, that's me. That's my problem. Is this the slide that you wanted or one more? Well, the series. I got a little distracted by the people coming in. Uh, is this the one we, that you want? Okay. Really. So this is basically, and the, you can use this for, I'm going to show you the three configurations that we basically use in molecular locks. This configuration is particularly useful if you're doing diagnostics. If you want to just see how many copies of something that I have uh, to read it off. And I'll explain how that all works later. Um, but basically what's happening here is this guy is binding, uh, this is the least. A singleton is binding the least. This is the next up, and this is the next up. And these are separated by orders of magnitude in binding affinity. So if this is 10 to the minus, let's say we drop it down to 10 to the minus 6. This guy was originally 10 to the minus 8. This guy is at 10 to the minus 12 molar. Oh, the screen, we can't I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. So, so, so basically, what, what happens is, if, if this guy's binding as a singleton, he's the least. He's now 10 to the minus 6. This guy's at 10 to the minus 8. But the doubleton, remember, you're squaring the binding thing. This is at 10 to the minus 12. And so, as you add these together, you get exquisite specificity. And this is, in fact, how transcriptional regulation works. It's a pylon phenomenon. You have a bunch of weak things that have to get together in the right, right thing. And these, 
These bases are transducers for the nucleic acids. And all we've done is deconstructed that and shown how to rebuild it back up again so you can control it. Okay, so now you have a completely controllable system. You can hit any target that you want in the nucleic acid. Um, preferential targets happen to be things called promoters. They control whether genes are on or off. But you can build your own, and I'll show you how you do that. In fact, somebody read our patent at, at, uh, at Harvard and built their own, and it, and it worked beautifully. Um, so using our sequences, but didn't credit us in the paper. Um, so uh, here's, the, here's the steps. You basically figure out uh, what your target is. You identify the protein binding sites within it. Then you evaluate the spacing. You make sure they're faced together. And then you build, build your lock. And we'll show you an example of how to go about that for an actual sequence. And then once we've done that, we'll, we'll get into the circuitry of how, how these things work. So this is the HIV LTR, controls replication of the HIV virus. You go along and you look at the binding sites and you ask, where are they? What's their spacing? And your spacing will tell you which, when proteins bind, which side of the helix they're on. And then what you do is you create sets of these that are on the same side. And those sets become your targets for building your lock. Once you have those sets, you can build, build different things. But the three most useful kinds of locks that you can build, um, you put an oligomerization domain on the back side of it. And the oligomerization domain, you have the binding domain that recognizes a specific structural feature of the nucleic acid. And it, it is not Watson and Crick's, Crick's B DNA. The sugars are repuckering. The bases are swinging in and out. These are beautiful, unique signatures within the nucleic acid that they're recognizing. You put an oligomerization domain on it, and that allows you to control what the molecule looks like. And our three favorite ways, this, this is not all of them, but these are the three most useful ones, is to put a little handle on it. That's what you saw in, in, the, in the slide with the lock graphic on it. Once you put that handle on it, you can immobilize the handle. You can attach a polymer with a ratio of fluorophores on it and count it. Um, and that's very useful because we're going to show you why that's useful in figuring out what the circuit is inside of the cell as you go to tease it, tease it out. The second thing you can do which is really useful is you can hairpin it. If you hairpin, if, oh sorry, if you hairpin the nucleic acid here and the transcriptional apparatus jumps on, this gene turns on. And this is what the, the people that read our patent at Harvard went and did. They actually made one of these up. It's a synthetic promoter. And take this, took the sequence here and then made one that turns it on. So now this hairpinning <coughs> process turns the gene on. And we'll explain how that is effectively, that process is effectively an AND gate. Spooling the nucleic acid turns it off. And the spooling process is effectively an AND gate. And we're going to explain how you use these NANDs and ANDs in the process of engineering inside of the cell. OK, how do you even know that it's bound? Well, we use gels. And gels are really great because gels are graphic about what gets to interact with whom. And so what, you, what the gels tell you is, do I have the right components? Did they grab on? And if you see this band right here, that means it locked. Now, spooling it is just a matter of this thing coming around like this. And so we can actually go in and test these components. And what you see is these bands. And when you see, these band, when you, when you see the molecule lock, the band appears. Okay? So you can actually test them. And this is the, the hairpin configuration is very easy to test. Now you have a second task with these guys. Um, in the hairpin configuration, when you're turning a gene on, it's not adequate just to create the geometry. You have to create a little place for the transcriptional apparatus to, to jump on. And that, that's actually not that hard. Um, so here's the. Here's what that, and then there's also a similar process um, for making the, the, the spooling. So basically, you, you start off with your DNA. You figure out what the positions are. You figure out what ones would make good locks. And then you go ahead and you, and you make it. When you're done, how do you know that it bound to the thing and only the thing that you were making it to? And we do a thing called lock and drop. What you do is you basically put your lock on a bead, and then you see what it pulls out. If it pulls anything other than the thing you're looking for, you've got to go back and do another gel. Okay, but if it pulls out the thing you're looking for, you're done. It means your lock is now specific for that target and nowhere else. <coughs> if that's your virus, you're done. You've turned that virus off. So that's, how, that's actually how you go test it. If, if, you, if you drop one product here, 
That's your specific lock. If you drop more than one, you didn't tighten it down enough, you have to go back to the gel and start over again. So how do you actually test these inside of a cell? Well, you can, you can uh, have a synthetic promoter, which comes over here, and turns on the production of your gene. So the thing that you're looking for is going gonna, is gonna to turn off. You can actually turn it off inside the cell. And the same thing is true for activation. Here's your synthetic promoter. Here's your, your, your products. You produce those. So you don't actually have to deliver it to the cell yet. You can do that later, and I'll sh show you what that looks like. But th this, this, you just put this DNA in. It expresses it gene on, gene off. And you can actually go look at what happens when you turn your unique gene on. You now know because you run it past the entire genome you're testing it against, it's specific. Now you know when it's on and when it's off. Okay, so you've now taken it one, one step further. So, so far you have specificity, and now you can go inside the cell and you can test it. Well, for things like protein therapeutics, you have one more step to do. And that is, you have to hook another domain on it that allows it to internalize and go in. But what's nice about having the synthetic promoter step is that you can separate out those two things. You can actually separate out the process of knowing whether it's working inside of the cell from your delivery process. And in therapeutics and in uh, for mostly cell engineering, you're just going to use the cDNAs. But if you're engineering a, bi a biotherapeutic, this is really important because the, the, the little thing that you use to deliver it, it could be substance P, it could be a delivery domain from diphtheria toxin or exotoxin A from Pseudomonas ar aeruginosa. There are a number of things that, that, that you can deliver it with, whatever it is. Each thing that you deliver it with has a specific cell target. And so this is really exciting. Now you can target a specific gene, but you can also target a specific cell. So most drugs that are out there right now don't work like that. Um, the, what we, we call them uh, spill and mop. Stop and mop. That basically, if you have a hormone, you inundate the system, and that hormone does everything everywhere. Okay, which is why if you give an anemia drug, the person feels better because they, they have more reticulocytes, but they don't feel so good when, if they get breast cancer or prostate cancer from it. Okay, so the the this allows you to target the specific cell, and it allows you to target the process when the, within that cell. And if you're just turning off a virus. Well, that's good. You know, virus is off, you're fine. That, that's the cure for the, the thing that you're looking for. If you're looking at angiogenesis, if you're looking at cancer, if you're looking at pain, it's not adequate just to go turn a gene off. You turn one gene off, something else bad happens. Even if you can deliver it specifically to the cell, you've got to go in and ask, what is the circuit that I impacted? And how do I normalize that so that I achieve the best result? And this is the first time the tool has been available for people to actually go in and, and, and do that. So, and, and I would s suggest that actually computer, this is um, same, same thing for, for putting a, okay, so now we're going to get to computer science. Well, how does, how does computer science uh, essentially provide the context for moving this process forward? I mean, basically, so you could turn things on and off. You could do that all day. You could sit at the bench top. And you just turn things on and off and club things. Um, or what you can do is you can take advantage of the fact that electrical engineering computer science has evolved to the point where there's a whole set of principles that are there. And if you can hook those principles up with a process of discovery, whether it be engineering a cell to produce more oil, an algal cell, or engineering a cell so that angiogenesis is properly controlled, both those things, we believe, require a logical context. And that logical context is already there. You didn't have to look very far for it. Because in point of fact, the molecular locks are really NAND and NAND gates. Um, and once you realize that, you can build anything. I'll tell you a couple other properties of them that make them nice because you can do timing and other kinds of things. Um, so there, th these are actually the. In, in, an, in an electrical system, if you have a zero or one, you're looking at a change in value. Okay, so you have your zeros and your ones, a change in value. In a biological system, you're looking at whether you made a protein or not. So it's a huge difference. It means you can't just hook any zero in and have it be interpreted. Um, we're really using the nomenclature 
of electrical engineering to keep track of what's going on inside the cell so when we know what we're doing. And the way that you do that is you, it, it creates a constraint on you. So here's your AND. Your AND is your turning on molecular law. If the input of A and, if A and B are both present, C is made. If A and B are both present on the promoter, C is made. And C now has to feed into something which accepts C. So it's not just like any zero or any one. But once you do this, you can actually start to write really elaborate circuits for what you're doing. But more importantly, what it allows you to do is to interpret data where you've ablated or turned on a gene and begin to have a context to interpret that data in it. So the next slide shows you how that essentially a spooling molecular lock is a NAND gate. If both these components, if one of these components is missing, if A is missing, no spooling lock is formed because you need both of them. If B is missing, no spooling lock is formed. It's only when A and B are both present that the spooling lock is formed and the gene is off. So it's equivalent of a zero state. So essentially this gene on is your AND and gene off is this. If A and B lock are present, D is not made. Okay. Once you have that, and I, I, granted it's a stretch, we've tried to stay responsible to, and you'll see we bend it for shorthand no notation later, but once you've established that, you can begin to set up networks. And more importantly, currently people use arrays to look at what happens when you impact one gene event or, an, or another. You can begin to, to take the data directly from the arrays and feed it into the system, which is what we're working on right now. So, uh, and we're actually replacing the arrays with a, a different device. Um, so basically, what are, the, what are the, the things that you need to be thinking about when you're working in biological systems that are not present in electrical engineering? Well, in the case of uh, a lot of times you have these transcription factors, they're all over, you have to be absolutely sure. Now, here's, a, here's an example of, um, okay, this is HIV. Um, the red inputs are what are called REL binding domain inputs. So whenever that protein is, is, is upregulated, as you see with um, when the immune system is turned on, you also see CMV go on, the capillate chain promoter, beta-2 mi microglobulin. So when the immune system is on, HIV is on. And we thought about the idea of just when the immune system turns on, turning on HIV lock. And you can actually do that. And the, 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 well, if you put many, many copies, one copy is going to come back and inhibit itself, but they're going to be, let's just say you have 100 copies of it. There's still going to be 99 that are going to go and inhibit HIV from replicating. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is actually to put it under uh, a, a different promoter um, that actually turns on at the same time so that you're not in that, in that immediate feedback system. So the thing that's turning off your HIV is also going to be turning off uh, your, am I being clear? Okay, good. All right. So, um, and we had to start developing shorthands for this. We didn't really understand how, how to do it. So this is kind of what it looks like in our shorthand. And this is, this is where I mean where we've really crossed the line here. We shouldn't, I mean, it's bad enough that these are proteins now instead of zeros and ones. We've now put this NAND gate in front of this AND gate and made it an input, which is bad, but it actually tells you exactly what's going to happen. What it says is that if my proteins here... Why is it bad to label your, label your wires? Because um, this is supposed to always be the output as a protein, and this isn't an output, it's a result. No, no, it's, it's a, the, the protein type is a label. Um, yeah, it could be. Yeah, I'll let you argue it with Arthur. Um, Arthur. So the, the, the main idea is that on the left side, the AND and the NAND gates, they're the same sequence. They're the same transcription site. Right. So, so here what, what, what you're really looking at is a situation where if both these proteins are on, then it feeds into the system and basically, say this is a 1 and this is a 1 and this is a 0, it turns this off. And what that's really saying is an attempt to incorporate the fact that the binding of these two proteins is so much greater than the binding of these proteins for the system that it creates essentially a switch. And we'll be looking at other, other there's other ways of noting this so that it looks more like a switch, but we found that this was a good shorthand for it. 
Um, these two proteins on, this <coughs> comes to zero because this is a much stronger interaction than the original transcription factor pile on. So we've engineered a molecule which is stronger for the HIV LTR than the immune system turning it on. And so therefore, when this molecule is present, HIV is off. And here's all the proteins that HIV is making. Now you can use a couple of these proteins to come back in and feed back into the system and turn it off. And all of a sudden you start thinking of all the ways in which you can control the system. Now you have 10 more ideas about how to control the system sitting in here. Because you're looking at it as a circuit and not as, oh, I remember, HIV is a virus. It's turned on from the promoter. That's where we have to be. You, it, it, it's very restrictive to be, be thinking. Once you have these tools, you can start to think, what circuits do I want to create? Because you're not restricted. You can make a synthetic promoter if you want. You can take a protein coming off of here and have it some inter come back and interact in the system. So you can start to bring, bring in um, alternative ways of regulating um, the system. Um, I just want to show you regulation of genes. You turn genes off in your body that you've used for maybe six days in your development. They stay off for the rest of your life. This is a histone. The difference between a histone and the proteins that we make is a histone wraps up a set of targeted proteins, I mean, a targeted nucleic acid sequences, and it's basically an electrostatic interaction. It just says, if you're targeted, I'm going to wrap you up. Um, our molecules target specific nucleic acids um, so that they wrap them up. They also wrap, circularize them, um, but they do it by interacting with a major groove or interacting with uh, pieces of RNA that uh, are, are presented in certain ways. Um, but what this allows us to do, because histone is a really rough molecule, it basically will wrap anything up that's targeted to be wrapped up. Um, what we can start to do is add a second feature in here, which is small molecule control. So this is a molecule we use as a scaffold, and right in here it binds a small molecule. Okay? So we can set this molecule up so that it's in like pieces of a pie in thirds, and it has a binding domains on here, your A, B, C, binding domains. So it's binding at the cube of, of what would happen normally. It's been downshifted, but this is a very tight binder. Put our small molecule in here, and you can set this molecule up by creating a charge repelling at the, at the interfaces at which the small molecule counteracts. So when, only when all four components are present is the lock on. And what that looks like is this, that basically, and here's your constitutive production of these three. You don't care whether they're on. They're just proteins that are on all the time. These are not locking anything because they're missing the small molecule. Small molecule's not present. Nothing's happening here because this is a NAND gate. We're turning it off. We're spooling it. We're turning it off. Gene is on. Okay, we haven't turned anything off. When I come in here and I have my small molecule pulse, so a molecule comes on. This is now on. The, the center of this is completed, and the lock is on. The gene is now off because I've spooled it. Remember, it's a NAND gate. So it comes in. It's been on. The amount of small molecule comes in, makes the lock, makes the lock. It saturates the system. It stays like that for a period of time. And then it's cell division or such time as it comes off because these, these can be in a range of tightnesses. We can make them so tight they don't come off. We can make them so tight that they come off in cell division. We can make them so tight that they, come, that they come off regularly. So the slope of this line is really how fast they're coming off. And the length of this line is what is the event that causes them to come off, how, how long that is. So now you have a pulse. But there's other ways of pulsing it. This is just one example using a small molecule of how to pulse the thing being on and off. So it's starting to you know, look like computer science and electrical engineering. <laughs> Control flow, another, another property of the system. Um, and they're very good examples of this in biology. So here's control flow. Control flow looks like this. If I have this molecule, which binds tighter to a set of sequences that they compete for, than this molecule, I have one. I'm transcribing in this direction. Else, two. 
Okay? And there's a real life example of this. It's the lambda phage. Lambda phage in biology comes in and it's got a certain number of copies of itself. It infiltrates the cell. And then it asks two exquisitely beautiful questions. It asks, what is my strength and what is the strength of the cell that I'm entering? And the way that it does that is by managing uh, to interact with host cell enzymes to create copies of things that stabilize. And whether or not this thing goes in one direction or another, in the case of lambda, it's actually, there are two promoters, a right and left promoter, and it either goes this way or that way. Um, but it's the same principle, is, is a competition between the crow protein from bacteriophage lambda, which is set up to initially be on, being overwhelmed by the C1 protein, which sets it. And what's the difference between those two directions of transcription? In one case, the virus makes lots of copies of itself, bursts open the cell, and kills the cell. In the other case, the virus is not a bad place to be. There's enough of me. There's lots of food around. I'll stay here and it's a stable lysogen. So now you have control set up within the system to be able to go do that. So if you create your molecules so that those molecules compete for a thing and then you can control the values of those molecules, you can actually decide which genes you're turning on at any one time. So you have small molecules turning on which genes you have and then you have the direction of transcription selected by, by the control of this. And we can place these events under timing circuits that vary from, you can use anything. You could use a woman's menstrual cycle. You could use light. You can use circadian rhythms. You can use anything you want to actually control the system. Small molecules are convenient because you can actually control the amount of time that they're, they're actually in the system. Um, so, oh, Ira Hershkowitz. Yes, Ira Hershkowitz actually figured this out from UCSF and, um, uh, amazingly sort of figured out the entire bacteriophage lambda and bacteriophage lambda. Um, he wrote a paper called uh, uh, bacteriophage lambda, I, I think, believe the title was explicit programming and responsiveness. So Ira, who was a molecular biologist, was already thinking about, he didn't have a circuit background, but he was already thinking, look, these are programs really. And so he was really, the, I think, the first one to lay out a paper where he started to ask the question, could we really start to think about this? Now, he didn't have an engineering background. He wasn't, he wasn't blessed in that way, but he was a, you know, a superb molecular biologist. So he sorted out what are all the interactions, who's turning who, whom on, and what else is happening, um, laid it out beautifully for everybody else, and now we can look at that and say, that's a circuit. I know what every protein in that is doing in that circuit. I know how to represent that circuit by a set of, of uh, engineering tools that I already know how they work. And I can actually test what the values of those are by changing the concentrations of the proteins. And I can ask, you know, when is, when is this, this switch flipped? At what value relative for this to site, I can actually ask for this site here, what's the difference in binding affinity which will cause this thing to flip and when? So now you have an enormous amount of control in what you're in what you're generating. Um, why why is this important? Um, the, you guys all know what these are. I mean, you can feed these in endlessly and make and make uh, whatever feature set that you want. The reason why it's important is when you go to approach a problem like pain. Okay, pain, uh, chronic pain. I want to make a mo set of molecules that controls chronic pain. Okay, so a bunch of people have gone at that problem and they think, oh, you know, when I have chronic pain, I shoot, I lob out substance P. Okay, so that, that's, that's pain. It isn't pain. What pain is, I'm a neuron, I drop something on my foot, I'm in pain, I lob out my substance P, it might take me 12 hours to regenerate it, I send a signal up um, through the dorsal horn, and I come down and maybe I get some analgesia. But meanwhile, I've told everybody in my environment by screaming like a banshee that I'm in pain. So the fact that I actually lobbed the substance P across the, the neurons is, is only part of the issue. So if you have chronic pain and I'm constantly screaming like a banshee and lobbing, things start to happen. If you want to control pain, what you have to do is create a separate circuit. You have to renormalize that neuron so that it thinks that it's not in pain. And the way that you have to do that is by intercepting signals, 
shunting those signals and creating a system where you've essentially short-circuited the normal, normal process for doing that. The terribly exciting thing for me is once you've done that process, you can back off one more, and this should be exciting to you guys too, and start to create an interface between biology and electronics. Because if you can actually control that shunt, you can direct that shunt onto the next logical thing, which is an electrical, electrical system. So now you've got a mechanism for taking a biological system and coupling it to a non-biological system, because you can control all that. Once you've made that shunt, you're done. It's just about the engineering. So what I'm trying to convince engineers is that biology right now is at a nexus where the people actually doing the biology don't understand engineering. They do understand molecular biology, and they can be fabulous molecular biologists like Ira Hershkowitz, but they can only take it so far. Once you understand the engineering principles, you can actually walk in, look at an array, and what we're doing is really a little <coughs> device that's about this big. It's a little bit bigger than a, um, an iPod. And what it will do is actually do this for you. It will actually postulate what the circuit is. Because right now people are using arrays, and what an array looks like is basically you know, a set of pixels, and you, you do something to it, and the pixels change. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what happened there? I mean, what, what is it? What's mi been missing is it's fine to look at. People stare at them all the time, and they generate lots of them. But what happened? What is the circuit that controlled what happened? And as soon as you ask that question, Every pixel means something to you, and every pixel becomes a feature set within, within your, your analysis. And once that happens, you can control it. You can ask, if I'm right, this happens. It's not, it takes you from being a passive observer in the system to being actively in control of it. And what I'm trying to convince you also is that these tools are not that hard. Um, we got a lab together. It was about a lab bench about this big. And we could make as many proteins as we want using self-resynthesis have a bunch of gel boxes, and test as many of these locks as we want them. Then we can send out overnight and make DNA and put it inside the cell and test it. So your interface doesn't, isn't someone who's going to be sitting there um, with huge amounts of rats <laughs> you know, or something like that. It's you know, some, some reasonable pieces of equipment on a lab bench in order to be able to go do that. So that's the really exciting part about doing this is that now, all of a sudden, we can mate electrical engineering principles to a restricted process, which tells us enormous amounts of information about the biological systems that we're in. So if you want to do cancer, you want to do angiogenesis, what, what, let's see, what else I have here? <coughs> Small molecules. OK. Um, this is, we've already talked about this. This is the case of EPO. EPO Basically, it comes in, hormone binds on the outside, comes in, activates the cytokine responsive element, the same one that is activated in the cytokine storm when you get influenza. Come in here, you know, guess what? You know, if you have uh, premalignant breast cancer, you've just accelerated your breast cancer. If you have premalignant um, prostate cancer, you've just accelerated that. It doesn't have to be this way. So we've been working with pharmaceutical companies to try to get them to understand what the platform is and we're now getting companies that are saying, I want to buy the platform. I want to work with the platform to develop drugs. Well, that, that's really great. But each one of them is going to need some hand-holding, <laughs> you know, either internally or externally. And I think that's a great source of jobs for, for people coming out of programs like this at Stanford is to going to be to get into this and really um, do it rigorously. Because the only people that are really well-trained to do this are actually double E in computer science majors to actually look at the data and understand what it really actually means. Um, so there's tons of data out there. The arrays, soon we'll have the, we call it the Bayugo. The Bayugo will be able to do this for you. And in fact, we're, we're planning on putting software into it that will suggest what the pathways are on the basis of the data that, that's being seen. And we'll be able to do that because remember, we had our molecular locks that are diagnostics. They tell you what's happened in your system and they can report that by a ratio of fluorophores, which acts like a barcode, so it reports what's going on in your system. And then you go back and you ask, what model, electrical engineering model, fits that system? And we think that's going to be really exciting, that we're going to be able to do a lot of um, uh, terribly exciting things with that. Um, so we, we patented it, but we're opening it up broadly uh, to everyone. Uh, for example, uh, 
We're in discussions with companies that are licensed it to engineer algae. We're in discussions with people that are going to be using it just to stop the cells that make drugs from getting infections. We actually had an interesting discussion with a pharmaceutical company where they're really having trouble with trying to understand how they were going to use it to design pharmaceuticals, but they said, oh, but you know, we're really having a problem with the viruses in our system. And I said, well, if you can control the viruses that are producing your drugs, then you can also make drugs with it. But, you know, it's a new technology. It's going to take a while for it to be accepted. Um, we took the position that everybody should have it, that we shouldn't really give it to one group or another group, but that we should open it up broadly. And then the best people that, that are capable of using it will, you know, produce drugs. Um, and that's pretty much the talk. So if you have questions. So I understand and I respect the, the work you're doing on drugs and biological systems. But if we think about it as an information system and think about it in terms of applications to information systems, then what we're concerned with primarily is inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. So from your talk, I understand that the input is particular um, molecules. Yes. Those are the input triggers. And I can have, I, and they change, I can see the change optically, mm -hmm. whether it's in color or with a spectrum mask of some kind. Right. Right? And now, you were talking about an electrical interface. How would the electrical interface work in terms of input and output in that system? Well, if you can, if you can solve the problem of the neuron thinking that it's perfectly fine when it's getting a pain signal. Okay, so basically, it, 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 it's no longer lobbing substance P. It's no longer telling all of its friends it's in trouble. Um, it, there's, glute, there's all kinds of things that are regulated, um, changed when it's experiencing pain. So you're essentially shunting that process and, and controlling that process. Um, what that means is, is you can put whatever you want in front of that. So now all of a sudden, yeah, if you try to, and I've done this, actually, I used to make neurons try to contact other things. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, well, maybe it needs acetylcholine patches. And so we give it acetylcholine <laughs> patches. We try to induce it to go over and, and, and look at it. And, and it liked the acetylcholine patches. It was very happy with acetylcholine patches. In fact, it was a, at one point, it was unclear whether or not the acetylcholine was patching to the neuron or the neuron was, it was, was homing to the acetylcholine receptor. Well, you know, we know what it wants on the other side of it. So the question is, we have a lot of flexibility now. We can go in and we can say to it, okay, we're going to give it what it wants over here, but guess what? Instead of this acetylcholine re receptor patch doing something like this hormone did on the other side, I'm going to have it talk directly to a piece of electronic equipment. How? Well, it, it, let's just imagine that you ha it's a channel, okay? And that channel controls calcium input. And it's a two-way channel, okay? So now I can completely control whether there's a signal on that thing. So by, by, by setting calcium ions? Calcium ions is one of the things. Glutamate, there's a number of things which, which are important in that process. Yeah. Some years ago, we had a talk by a researcher from Max Planck who uh, demonstrated uh, uh, direct neuron to electronics connections, uh, both for inputs and outputs. And it's on the, uh, the website. Uh, his mind, there's, his name escapes me at the moment, but uh, it's a fascinating talk and something you might want to dig out. They don't like it, but I think that if we provided them with an artificial interface, um, and we could also control what was happening inside the cell. Because cells are really perceptive in the sense of, I mean, I'm not anthropomorphizing, I hope, too much. They're very perceptive in when their environments change. They have very particular things that they like on the other side of it. So part of it is you just have to say you can't be that picky. Okay? But you still have to be normal because we're still using you in your biological context. So once you start creating shunts around events, if, if, it's, if it's pain, it's pain. I mean, I have a fast fiber firing. It's going into my spinal inner neuron. It go, it's an ascending pathway. Well, you know, if, you, if I put capsaicin on my finger, what I can do is get temporary analgesia because I, don't, I can't re replace substance P. But that doesn't work too, too long, okay? So there are other issues associated with that. So the issue is once you've created a shunt for pain, then what you've really said is, I can control any input to the neuron that I want. It's the perception of any input that I want to the neuron, whether it thinks it's normal or not. I can get it to ignore something it normally couldn't ignore. So once you've done that, then you can say, OK, I want to create a different responsiveness to you, to you now. I want to now take this 
neuron, and I want to make it, instead of uh, responsive <coughs> to pressure, I want to make it responsive to an electrical signal. Um, and that's very doable. That's very doable in particular by using a number of, of calcium glutamate, other kinds of, other kinds of things. But you have to learn how to control it first. And you have to learn how to control it in a way that doesn't create additional problems. And right now, the, the problems in biology is we, we club things. You know, we turn this gene off. We mop it up with antibodies. And if, you're, if, you, have, if you have a VEGF antibody, good example, um, if I cut myself and I have to have vessels forming back across, I can't distinguish that from a necrotic center where I've got rapidly dividing cells on the outside um, and suddenly they turn on to create blood vessels growing in. If I can distinguish between those two events and they're distinguishable by the set of events, I can now say you only get to do this when you have active con contact inhibition events because the cells kind of paw each other. Um, and they ruffle, and then when they stop ruffling, something happens. But unless this is happening, you don't get to do you don't get to do this other thing. But running around just sopping up that that jaff has isn't a good thing. Um, and so as we learn to control more complex things, we need to understand what's happening inside the cell, and we need to be able to we need to be able to ping it. I mean, we don't really have the cell as an experimental system yet, but this allows you. Not only the tools to experiment with it, but also the ability to look at what that result is, rationalize it, develop a circuit for it, put it back in and test it in a, in a very quick cycle. So everything's there from what it, you need to actually test the molecules, to build the molecules, to make sure they're specific, to turn on the thing that you want to go turn on, and then to test what, what, your, what your system is. So your focus here has been on DNA. What about RNA? relationship to that and to the replication cycle? Well, RNA is really, is really interesting. It's the most fascinating of the nucleic acids. I mean, it's really, it, it, it's stunningly interesting. I sat next to Tom Check one time and he said that people have been telling him, even after he won the Nobel Prize for ribozymes, that it wasn't an enzyme. That people would walk up and poke at him and say, this is not an enzyme. Well, they fold up. And I mean, Wally Gilbert, who figured out how to sequence DNA, coined the term exon you know, genes sometimes come in parts, and those parts come together, and this thing splices itself out. And Czech showed it in tetrahymena. Um, if you want to turn a virus off, say influenza virus, which is one we just finished, um, influenza virus, you need to turn it off at the RNA level. And so we spent a lot of time trying to understand what the structure of RNA really is, because DNA kind of had everybody fooled. You know, um, uh, Rosalind Franklin went in and worked on it, and then, you know, Watson and Crick had to figure out whether it was this or that, and then they, they published it. Um, well, it doesn't look like that. BDNA it doesn't exist. Because you're sitting there, you have these charges that are going up, up the, the backside of the thing, and then you have sugars, and then you have these bases swinging in and out, and they're making these very elaborate structures which proteins are interacting with. So these are signatures in the nucleic acid. BDNA doesn't exist except maybe in crystals. So RNA is a harder problem, but a more interesting problem, in that what causes it to, to form the structures that it is. And I, I left the slide out because I thought it would be too complicated, but I have a lock for RNA and a lock for, for DNA. And they don't look all that different, the lock, the lock structures for them. So RNA. You can't just say, oh, A, B, C, it's going to pretty much line up like this. And people, people get really comforted by DNA because the reason why DNA looks like it is is that you have pi orbitals, and pi orbitals like to stack. And the reason why they like to stack is when they release their water, they increase the entropy of the system. And so they like to stack, and they'll just do that. And then you put hydrogen bonds on the end of them, and they kind of like to orient, but they don't absolutely require it so that you can have base pair mismatches. They don't really care that much. Because the thing that makes them sort of stack in that position is the fact that when they, when the waters, in, uh, when the bases stack over one another and make contact, the waters uh, are now free to move about, and that increases the entropy of the system. So that's why, and we all feel comforted by that. But RNA is just as legitimate a molecule 
and, and perhaps even more interesting in a lot of ways. So, um, yeah, there are a couple of steps in that DNA lineup, including the identification of ribozymes by Tom Cech. Um, now we have siRNA. The problem with siRNA is you can't deliver it. And we have all these companies that invested in siRNA, and they've just been whacking their head against the wall trying to deliver it. Well, it's charged, right? When, when a cell sees RNA, it goes, chop it up quick. It's, it's the enemy. You know, and if you get it inside, it's a you know, quick immune response. It's the enemy. You know, so it's basically, you know, it doesn't want to deal with it. But proteins are different. Proteins have been moved in and out, um, you know, all the time. They're really well, you know, they sort of show up at the outside and they say, I'm ready for pH driven insertion. And the cell goes, fine, you know, hook on. <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they go through their thing. So, you know, there, it's a much different situation delivering a protein than it is siRNA. Although siRNA is a great tool, you know, for looking at what happens when you turn things on and off. You have to kind of make it small, and there's lots of issues, and now there are microRNAs, and people are looking at it. But this is a much more precise tool. Um, so, you know, it, it, I think they're all good technologies. It's just that you can do more with this. And the fact that it, it, it effectively acts as a NAND and NAND gate, you can start to do logic, and you can't do that with siRNA. And the reason is cooperativity. You can't really do RNA cooperatively. It just can't be done. This, is, this allows you to target something really specifically um, that's a, a, a complex feature of the nucleic acid you want to target. And you can't do that with a, a siRNA. So how complicated are circuit diagram have you folks made to work with? Pretty complicated. Hundreds of things. We were engineering algae. We had this little algae, it was, it, it was just had beautiful characteristics. And algae's kind of like, I, I, I came to think of them for a while, like um, solar panels that are wet. You know, they, they like to be in a certain water column. And we decided, let's just see how far we could push this algae. So the algae had a lot of issues. And it was very meticulous, it liked to be, but it made 50% triglycerides and was really good at it. So the thing is, is that how far could you push it? And so that was really, we've decided not to do algae at all. We're not in the algae business at all anymore. And the reason is no matter how far you put, pushed it, it was just too much work to get it to make the things you wanted to get it to do. That, that biological systems are meant to be homeostatic. Um, this particular algae had a little um, globule that it made and it was like a buoyancy compensator. It kept it in the right place in the water column. It got rid of a lot of problems for it like osmotic effects to try to keep sugar and other kinds of things in it. So it used oil instead. Um, it had a lot of really nice characteristics, but um, there were really better solutions. We decided in the energy space we were going to do something completely different. Um, so we're actually now licensing out to algae companies to go do this, and we'll help them if, if they want, because we already have a jump start on this. But you can, you can push them pretty hard. I mean, it's like running a horse through a fire with blinders on, because you're telling it, don't do all the housekeeping functions that you've spent because they, they like to sit in there. Th they don't want to use up all their food because if they do, they die because they eat everything in sight and then they, they're sitting out in the middle of wherever they are and they die. So they've learned to become very meticulous about their environments. So you can put blinders on them and run them through fire and you can get them to make things. But we didn't feel like the volumes that you could make it. We think we're probably the best guys at, at, at algal engineering right now. But um, and it, the compartmentalization problem was taken care of in this particular algae, too, because one of the biggest problems you have is end product inhibition, um, which people bump up against when they're trying to make it in other organisms. Um, so, yeah, pretty elaborate. You, you can do pretty elaborate things. But we'd like, we're now trying to go into humans where we're, we're really trying to propose solutions for human ailments, and we think that's going to be really satisfying. Um, and that's what we're doing. So, and we're trying to push... Um, the use of this device so that we can get this device out next year um, that will allow people to almost not think about it. I mean, we want them to think about it because then they'll engineer better solutions, but at least the tool will be there to allow them to collect the data very rapidly to feed into programs that will then look to ask, what is the circuit? And that's going to be very exciting, I think, because I think that's a place where a lot of input from other people will, will come in terms of analyzing and figuring that, because that's data bound, and that's a situation where you just have a lot of data, and somebody can take a look at that, and they don't have to get their hands wet in order to do it. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, this is kind of a clubbed over the head question, but 
Don't you have sufficient specificity to excise viral DNA? Um, there's a real issue about how people are going to use this. We're talking to some companies that want to use, um, develop this as a pharmaceutical. And it was really interesting. The, when you talk to people about viruses, they have two approaches to it. One is, can you deliver protein because we, we don't want to change people's DNA. Okay, so you could put a cDNA in and just turn it off. But now they want to deliver a protein, which is an injectable. Um, and then we've even had conversation that says, why don't we just turn it on so that you can kill it, which I think is a less good solution. Um, so the, the conversations have been all over the place, but we're trying to find a partner for that right now. So basically, we, we see our role as technology providers, and we see these guys as pharmaceutical companies. And so if just turning it off is a pharmaceutical, then they're welcome to it. And we'll, we're trying to really figure out who's going to be our partner on, on the HIV. The influenza is another really good one. Um, if you actually look at the enzymes for uh, neuramidase and um, a um, for the for the if you actually look at the neuraminase and you look at a seltamivir and xanamivir, um, basically there's a cluster of changes that has happened that confer complete resistance to those. Now people are trying to come out with new ones, but rapidly that resistance is is, is built into those things. So if you grab the RNA and prevent it from replicating, it's a, it's the same thing. Um, so. The question is, how, how will people develop that? Um, the second thing you can do is also, if a person's already sick, um, tap down the cytokine storm, which is the thing that kills them. So basically, that promoter that we just showed you, we know, we, we know exactly what, how to control that. So right now, the biggest problem isn't that the technology isn't ready to do what it needs to do. It's that everybody's running around trying to figure out. You talk to a company, you say, OK, you want to work with HIV? And they go, wow, cool, great idea. And then we say, OK. Uh, what other molecules? And they say, you mean you can hit up all of our, change all of our drugs? We said, well, yeah, we think they'd be better drugs. And then they go, oh, God. You know, we have like six blockbuster drugs, and you just told us that we're going to, you're going to redo all six blockbuster drugs. So th the problem is in, in getting the technology out isn't in the fact that the technology isn't great technology. The problem is people, uh, first they're like, oh, let's do this project. And then they run it around through their scientists, and they go, uh-oh, you know, how are we going to do this? So what we said to them is, why don't you just take it in as a platform, and you can do anything you want, and you don't even have to report to us. We're always probably going to be a little bit better than you guys. And if you get stuck, we'll help you. Well, go ahead. Knock yourself out. And then you get to it faster. If somebody else gets to it faster, you know, it's tough. You fight it out with them. Um, but every drug that you're looking at can be reformulated as one or two, mostly, control events. EPO, Procrit, most reimbursed drug in, in history, um, is cytokine response element on. We know exactly what that element responds to. That's it. It's not, it's not any more complicated than that. Now, if you want to do a better job than EPO, that's, that's a different story. But if you just want to make a better EPO, it turns out one thing that took us a really long time to figure out is, is that if you have a technology that really allows you to do a lot of things, people really want to hear about incremental solutions. <laughs> you know? If you don't, it's like, what do you want to do? <laughs> you can do anything you want. You know? If you want to do asthma, well, let's just take the entire LTB4 pathway, and we'll just block you know, things, and then we'll look to see what happens off of that. You know, and then they go, you know, or you know, we ran into trouble with one company because we were talking about one drug, and they said, well, what about all these other drugs? And we said, they said, we can't tell you what it is, but we, it's in this area. So we said, here's 10 targets in this area. We know how to block all these targets. And they were all their targets. <laughs> so they were like running around like this. It's not that complicated. It's a very simple technology to use. Get out there you know, with your pads on and fight it out with everybody. But it's going to take a little bit of education, and we've tried to really open it up. But they're, you know, they're not we're saying, Look, you can just have the whole platform. <laughs> They're like, no, no, we don't want anybody else to compete with us, you know, on it. So everybody's doing antibodies because you can anybody can make an antibody. I mean, we used to make antibodies by injecting chickens in the breast, and then it comes out in the eggs. You get milligrams of, of antibodies out in the eggs. Anybody can make an antibody with a syringe, you know. So it, it, and now they're made in, in cell lines. 
um, and everybody can make them. So all the drugs you're seeing right now are antibody drugs. Because what hormones and factors are left? You know, people are running around trying to find out hormones and factors. But so I th we think that the antibody thing will turn over into this when people realize that they can use them as more precisely, more precise terms. If pe someone's looking at an antibody and they know they can raise it, they're, and they think it's complicated to do, they're going to have a hard time jumping to the technology. But if they know anybody can do it, we say, look, we can do it. And, you know, Arthur made his first, first protein. He had never actually, he's a computer scientist. We got on a plane to go to Berlin. I said, this is what a pipette man looks like when you tap it down. He spent the next half hour telling me why there are too many degrees of, of precision on it, that he was putting it in a very fine thing and, and saying, look, it doesn't weigh that much. And I was saying, you know, it's, it's proximate. And molecular biology is proximate. He's like, no, no, how can they sell this? as too many degrees of precision. I said, okay, follow the instruction set, and in two days you'll make a protein. Well, we did. We went over there and made it. So these are not hard technologies to use. We, we really hope that people are going to take it up and, and, and make it. But I think it requires support for doing the most important <coughs> problems, which are angiogenesis, cancer, pain, um, atypical uh, psychosis. Um, is another another issue. Those are much more complex, and they'll require the input of of people th with this kind of training. I think. So. Is there an analog to molecular lock stuff uh, in cell biology itself? That is, the cell mechanism operate in much the same fashion. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, the way it works is that there's a pylon. When we filed our patents, we didn't know that it worked this way. It actually was discovered to work this way. But the the thing is, is there's a pylon phenomenon. So basically what happens is, for each of these promoters, a bunch of things happen. And these are all independent. This is a transducer. It's really saying, I got this happening. I'm, I'm going to set this up to, to go. And then if this, this, and this happens, I won't go. Or if this, this, and this happens, I will go. And so what we've really done is just regularize something that happens in biology. The fact that lambda virus is controlled exactly this way. There's two proteins competing to make that switch. It's called the lytic lysogenic switch. It's really well understood. You can actually, you know, flip the switch um, in a in a lab bench really easily. Um, but that's that's really what you're looking at. Is you're looking at it, uh, um, an if else statement. Is really what it is. So I've got a few little questions. Hopefully, we're very kind of almost uh, logic and or no answers. So do you have a list of publication references that would discuss some of this? Yeah, in fact, you can also go to our website, and you can go to our patents. They describe it really well. Um, there are people that have read our patents and then tried it out, and it works um, at Harvard. Um, so uh, somebody just created a synthetic promoter using um, uh, C1 protein from Lambda on one side of it, and they showed that you could actually make things happen from that promoter. Um, and they're actually sequences that were in our patent. If you, the patent tells, pretty much runs through a lot of it. And if you have any other questions, just uh, contact me, and I'll be happy to answer them for you. OK, and then your device. How many pixels does it have? Approximately. 100, 1,000, a million, a billion? It's, um, uh, Yeah, it doesn't. The, the, the way that the booster works is that the booster carries a ratio of floor fours on it. And the floor fours are aligned so that they're not just floating around space quenching each other. So when it fires, it, it, it looks like a step function. So you have three different floor fours firing at different levels. And those levels are multiples of how many copies are there. So they're always at the same level. They're not, they're not free floating once, once a certain event has, has occurred. So if you're reading that um, using a, a Geiger mode um, avalanche detector, um, what it, it looks like is essentially um, a related set of numbers at a point. So I, I could read, you know, I just make up a number, 123, 256, 780. I know that a copy of this has been expressed on that. So uh, array is pixelated because 
you've laid down in little squares the sequences that adsorb the nucleic acid you're looking for, and they sort of fill in and, and get dark. Okay. This doesn't work like that at all. It can, be, it can r run in a crude lysate, um, and our molecules can latch onto the nucleic acid without any of the prep elaborate preparation steps. So if I have a natural sample right now, I need to take that cell and break it apart, and then I need to strip the nucleic, I mean the proteins off with guanidine thiocyanate, then I need to un get the, the strands across, and then I need to put separate them and put them onto my array. By the time that's happened, all my RNA is gone, everything's gone. Okay? We do it a little differently. We we say, okay, well, so we're gonna take this this thing and we're gonna do a prep, and then we're gonna inundate this with so much protein, because protein's so cheap to make. And the protein homes everywhere, and then it locks. Because as you know, Biological systems are low Reynolds number situations. They are highly viscous. And the only way that you get two molecules to interact is by making them small and highly concentrated so that they can, they can get to their, their targets. So they can stabilize the, the system that they're in. And then when they lock, when they lock, I don't know if you remember that lock uh, picture, the, now all of a sudden enzymes that are normally degrading in the system can't degrade that lock, that lock's set. It's chemically and thermally stable because the binding affinity is so high. So now you can heat everything else in the system and degrade everything else in the system, and the only thing left over is your box. So now all of a sudden you can start measuring things. And if those boxes are nested, you can measure features. So unlike sequencing, you're not sequencing the genome. What you're asking is, and with these act like as sparsely populated matrices, so that you can actually say, oh, well, I've got if you're just saying, is the thing there, is this bacterium or virus or whatever, in this very complex sample that I have there, then it's a sparsely populated matrix. If you're looking to catalog what happened in that cell, then there's a, a different way to do it. And so um, it can happen anywhere on that device. Because, you know, a Geiger mode avalanche detector is just a piece of silicon, and you just looked at the breakdown voltage, right? It's not complicated. In fact, there's some guy like in Croatia that's like making it out of paper bags and tape. I mean, it was like ridiculous. I mean, people make them and they do a really good job of them. Um, SRIs, uh, uh, Sarnoff and Hamamatsu, and uh, there's a bunch of companies that make them. Um, but they're not hard. You can make them at home. They're really, actually, <laughs> really easy to make. Um, and it depends on the question that you're asking. And we have a lot of flexibility in our system and stability in our system. So we can do all kinds of things these guys can't do. Isn't, the answer isn't what the question is. I'm sorry, which was I supposed to answer? He asked the pixels, and it wasn't there. It's is not really a pixel. It, you can measure it wherever it lies. So you don't, ha you don't have a pixelation of the process. It's, it's more just a, s a signal that's coming off of that, and that signal is in a ratio. And when you read that ratio, whatever that ratio, no matter how many copies it is, is the increase in relationship between the ratio of flow force. Yeah. How does designer use work? Like if I figure out how to make caffeine once, is that good enough? Caffeine? Like, so you're talking about building proteins, right? So in, so in VLSI, when you're making microchips, you know, one guy figured out how to make adders once. Right. That's it. Right. Nobody else really thought about it too hard. Right. I mean, people are Adders are bad example. So adders are bad example. Adders are bad example, but, you know, one guy figured out how to do it good enough, and then everybody else said, good enough is good enough for me. Right. There are people who keep going, but it, this is kind of the same way as you right. probably have a pretty, want to have a library, or does it change from setting to setting? You know, if I'm in algae, I have to use one library. If I'm in people, I have to use another library. Um, there's two different kinds of molecules you can use. One we call um, organism specific, and those are easy to find. They're transcription factors, and they're things that are within the organisms. And basically, the transcription factors usually kind of come with something that hangs in the cytoplasm plus the DNA binding domain or something that organizes in that. And they're usually very convenient, so you can lop them off. And they're pretty well known, and you can actually search for them in the genome and find things that are like them. And it's, it's not that hard to find them. Um, that's one way to do it. And those are great because they're kind of nice big things, and you know that they're specific to the organism that you're in. And those are also really useful because if you don't have a universal set, if you're not using a universal set, I can take something from a bacteria and put it in a human, and it's never seen it. It doesn't, doesn't know about it. Okay, so I can create my separate circuit because it doesn't, it never saw it before. So that's good, that's a good feature of it. But you can also create them from a universal set. And those are small, those are much smaller. So the things these are binding over about a 
well, it varies, but if it's DNA, it could be anywhere from, the bigger ones are anywhere from a 6 to 20 base pair region. Um, but you can get ones that are basically doing the thing that they need to do over a 4 base pair region, but they have obvious stability requirements over a bigger rate. They have to be on the thing. Well, that's, that's good enough. You know, and that's, when you start building that, then you've got a covering set. So the question is, what's the value of the covering set versus what's the value of the species specific? I want something species specific if I'm going to go cross species, because then I know I'm, it's never seen it before. Um, if I'm going to try to build something to a coding region, I need a covering set because the coding regions in general don't have those features that I would be able to pick from. So it kind of depends on where you are. And what we're going to try to do is get as much of the information out as we can to people. Our, our goal is really to have these being widely used as a tool across the board for everybody. We've talked to reagents manufacturers about possibly putting these out so that people can use them. Um, uh, but, you know, we're, and this happened, this happened over the past few weeks. Um, to be we even had our heads down developing tools, and then we realized, wow, this is really useful. People should, should do these. So we looked up, and then it's a very complex world, the commercial world. So let's ask the question. The complex, what are the social obstacles to getting this stuff out to people and getting people to use it? You mentioned, ah, it's sort of screwing up all our plans. Well, okay. Somebody's going to screw up your plans anyway. Right, that's what we say to them. You know, yeah, but that, better they, they, hate, they hate that. So, right, they don't want that. <laughs> so where are you? Um, well, we're getting a lot of traction for taking the platform on. There's something about them that really wants to, and some of these guys, you got to hand it to them. They've paid hundreds and hundreds of millions and billions of dollars for these things that don't work or are working modestly or work part of the way. And so now they turn around and we're like, oh, we don't care, just give us a license fee. You know, and, <laughs> and, and it, it's hard for them to absorb. And you have to understand that they had planned on just doing this antibody thing for some time. Chargeable. Well, it could be, yeah. But if, if they're used to paying $5 billion, <laughs> you're leaving money on the table. Well, we figure they're going to run around for a while and we'll, we'll teach them how to do it. But if they just want one really precisely done, they're probably going to ask us. Um, and we'd be happy to give it to them. Um, it's a problem. I mean, it's a real problem to try to get a new, a new technology out. Because we've been through th three companies, three really big companies right now, and it's hard for them <coughs> to, to access the, the, it takes them a while to get used to it. And you can kind of start to convince them. First of all, it's, it, they need to know it's transferable, that they can use it right away, that they're not going to have restrictions. They don't really want to be telling you every, everything. We don't want to know about their targets. Um, it's like that company that said, oh, you know, we can't tell you what your targets are. And I said, well, you know, here's the 10 you're going to look at. And they, w they went, how'd you know that? And we said, well, they're obvious. I mean, they're, they're pretty obvious out there. So when the genomics catches up with it, every, I think everybody's going to start using these tools. We want to be a tools provider. We want to be a technology provider. That's our role. That's what we do well. We, we've been asked to be a pharmaceutical company, a bio Google. Um, and we think that um, that's a bad play because these pharmaceutical companies are so extensive and they have such deep depth in their areas in terms of regulatory affairs and everything. And th to have one company try to reconstitute that would be very, very difficult. By the time you did it, your day would be over. You might as well just give it to them right now and let them go with it. Um, does anybody have any other technical questions? Or? I think we're coming out of, spreading out of time. OK. And so I think I want to just say thank you. Very thank much. you. It's been very For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.